until he's on, I'll, I'll be talking about exactly what the title is. The fact that a payday alone is provided online makes it more expensive. Okay, you can, you can leave the room now. Actually, <laughs> uh, this is joint work with Peter Han, uh, a dear colleague from my times in Illinois. He's on the market. He's a lovely person to work with, so keep an eye on him. And instead of promoting my second paper, I promote my co-author. Um, and Jalan, a uh, great uh, professional friend and co-author. And let me get started. So, this audience, I don't quite need to explain in depth what a payday loan means. These are very small um, loans that are usually given at a store with beautiful neon lights saying, get cash now, easy cash, here's money for you. Um, however, customers pay high fees. And usually the price is not in the form of an interest rate because if you tell someone, would you like a loan at 300%, that person will say no. They're usually advertised in how many dollars you need to pay in fee for each hundred that you borrow. First thing, very irrespective of loan maturity. Charging the same interest, regardless of the maturity, generates an inverted term structure. Okay, we know how we don't like inverted term structures. And so this speaks a lot about the environment in which we're in. Also, payday lenders tend to ge geographically locate themselves around vulnerable communities. And there's people in this room that you can talk to about the location of payday loan shops. Um, it also it seems not to be quite a competitive market. We, we're not going to speak about the idea of the market a lot. Um, we'll touch on it. But it's a market with high fixed costs. You need to own a store, you need to pay a clerk uh, to be there uh, telling people, let me see your paycheck, uh, write me a check for the day you get paid. Uh, this is going to be the most senior claim on a workman's wage and whatnot. Okay, and with the advent of fintech and online technology, a natural question is, can the fact that you're not in a store and you just have a website running and you can project how many loans you can online, can it lower prices? Well, the title of the paper says that no. What we're going to do today is we're going to try to convince you that there is a, around a 100 percentage point APR premium on all loans. So if you want two numbers to leave this room, is at the store, you pay 300. Online, you pay 400. Percent fee. Okay, that's a lot. But we already have been debating for decades that payday loans are too expensive. Are they predatory? Are they good? Are they bad? Well, online payday loans are very expensive. Uh, we're going to do it. I'm going to show you some stylized facts, graphical evidence. Then I'm going to earn my salary as an economist, and I'm going to do regressions. Uh, I'm going to try to claim my estimate, show that the premium is really a premium. And I'm going to show you that there's even larger magnitude when the same consumer borrows online and at the store, this premium increases. So really, no matter what I do, the premium is there. Um, now, as of now, I'm telling you, this is more expensive than that. Do I need a paper to tell you that? No, the paper should explain why. And what we can do is we will test whether information asymmetry can be a potential culprit for this period. So we're going to run classic tests, uh, cap or any type of tests with our interpretation. And then we'll exploit some differences in state laws with respect to mandatory reporting on databases. The state, the state of the art of literature is what I told you. So it starts with more than 10 years of research of people going against each other saying payday loans are good because they provide money when you need to, payday loans are bad because they rip off consumers, and then it kind of closes with someone writing the paper saying, you know, in good times or normal times, payday loans are not so good because they get people into debt traps, but when times get hard, it actually is good that they're there for the person to provide immediacy more than liquidity. Okay? Uh, we go beyond that. We ask whether technology can lower prices. That uh, online payday loan sphere has not been focused on. There's a little bit of online work in the UK. Um, that was Brian Bow's job market paper also on online lo uh, payday loans. We bring it into like, the role of fintech lens. There's mortgage literature saying that mortgage lenders, uh, fintech lenders, 
tried a little bit more to provide higher quality of service to allow customers to say borrowing their pajamas at 3 a.m. and walking away within, within 30 seconds to have value for the consumers. Uh, all of that has been done. Uh, what we do is we bring this technology fintech angle to back to payday loans to kind of comment on how these things are priced. Uh, and obviously we add to the to the literature on info asymmetry in credit markets. So what's our data? Um, it's, it's an amazing data set that allows us to do exactly this. So Clarity is a subsidiary of Experian, and this is their subprime part of the, of the data they have. They furnish us with both loan applications and loan themselves, so we do observe all the stuff we'd like to observe. There's something we like to observe that we don't, which is lender IDs. So if you're expecting me to yell that I'm gonna use fixed effects for lenders, I don't. Okay? Very transparent about my limitations. Um, but I, I'm going to do something very cool that's not quite common. I will have two randomly drawn samples from the same provider. One that we got as a demo of payday loans only, 13 to 17, a million random consumers, a third of them with payday loan inquiries, and then it goes to a sixth of them with loan. And then when Illinois bought a gigantic pack of data, we go, we dig into that data from Experian and you bring the payday borrowers again. Okay, so two randomly selected samples. On sample two, we actually see the other credit and we see their credit score. On sample one, it's really just the payday loan demo. Uh, how, how are these data collected or at least like conveyed from the borrower to the lender? The online lenders, they cannot have neon lights telling people, come borrow with me. Online lenders do mostly two things. They target advertise. So if you start telling your friends I'm broke on Facebook Messenger, your cookies are gonna know it, and you're gonna start saying, get cash now on Facebook. And they use something called lead aggregation. This website here is a good example. You go and fill in your data, and then you get that, they call it a lead, and they go to the online payday lenders, in fact, to auction it. So a payday lender will pay for that lead so that they can lend to you. That increases the variable cost of lending. It doesn't increase the fixed one, but it increases the variable cost. Another tricky thing is, to sub subprime credit, and so they, people are taking advantage of, uh, the lead aggregator already asks people for their driver's license number, something as personal as that, uh, account number and routing number, so ACH info, goes into the lead aggregation. And we know ACH can be used just to claim whatever the lender needs. So we do see here a potential for technology to allow lenders to collect their payments more promptly rather than the person having to uh, write a check uh, to an account that might or not exist. The coverage is pretty comprehensive in the US. Uh, you do see some gray states for storefront loans. That's because <coughs> loans are banned in those states. Curiously, you do see an abundance of online loans in states with no storefront loans. That also hangs into the regulatory arbitrage that is solved so much on the mortgage fintech literature. Little detail, we are not given prices. We are given the loan amount requested, how much is due at repayment, and the duration. With these three numbers, we can compute an interest rate. Problem is, if the loan was not repaid, I, or if it was partially repaid, I don't have a nice repaid amount that allows me to compute an interest rate. So I can only really compute interest rates of non-defaulted loans. And then what we do is we impute uh, for defaulted loans interest rate of loans that are very similar to it. So we assume that ex-ante loans are, are priced similarly. And we'll, we'll show that this. So what we do on the descriptives? As I told you, small loans, around two to three hundred dollars, uh, APRs between three and four hundred percent. Duration of the loans ranges between two and four weeks, which is usually the pay periods with which these faults are paid. Um, some percentage of home ownership, around 40s in terms of average age, and 
if I look at the sample of ones that are not imputed, other than that 0% on the fault back construction, there's not much difference, and we do run the same stuff that I'm going to show you on just the non-imputed ones, and they're still the same. Uh, the striking difference is what I said. If you're borrowing online, your rate is 400. If you're borrowing with the store, your rate is 300. And this is a uh, premium of 4 to $5 uh, per $100 borrowed, which I'm also going to show. I'm also going to use two measures of price just because one is contaminated by uh, maturity, the other one is not. Statistics are exactly the same for both samples. Just here I can observe credit score and the percentage of folks that are unscorable. Double the people online are considered unscorable by experience. Um, but the credit score is the same. Now, starting with predicting default and, and trying to price credit. Uh, if one to price credit, we think about, okay, what makes credit risk appear? Well, let's think about income. So in the first graph on the x-axis, I have income, and then I have default rates. Okay, and as income increases, you're less likely to default, and you're constantly more likely to default online than at the store. So we do expect some pretty good there, surely. Also, credit score on my uh, credit scoreable sample really predicts default really well. As credit score increases, default decreases, as expected. So I'm showing you no news. Again, if you're borrowing online, you're systematically more likely to default than if you're borrowing at the store. So now let's look at price as a function of income, online and at the store fund, consistently higher online, and as a function of credit score. The pricing structures are flat. Okay. As you can see, income and credit score predicting default really well. I don't see them predicting prices. Prices are flat. And we call this the absence of risk-based pricing, at least at least at a loan level. So all of those are base scatters on with loan level information. Now let me try to explain this a little bit. I'm gonna use still the same loan level information, and I will estimate the simplest regression I've seen in this conference. Okay, I'm gonna throw time and, and market fixed effects. Uh, market can be state, can be zip code, and I mean it even going to be strict, as I told you, I'm going to put consumer fixed effect, so the same consumer going to one market and the other. I'll have a dummy for whether the loan is online or not, and that red beta gives me what I want, which is my premium. And then I do have all my nice controls coming from the original data set. And first time I show you a number, is going to be 100 percentage points of premium APR. Growing up to 140 when I have customer fixed effects. This results in around four to five dollars per um, hundred dollars water. In one sample and in the other, if I include control for credit score, that's what I do in here, even with less observations, if anything, my significance just goes up in terms of magnitudes they're in touch. They're a hundred for APR, four to five for customer. Default, not much going on default. I do have the fact that the same customer, if they choose to default, they're more likely to do so online. But for me, this tells me way more about the customer and our willingness, when we're part of a vulnerable community, to save face towards the store in our community, while online they don't see me, than what they tell me about pricing. Okay, so more about our behavior. Just a quirk that's okay to document, that might help explain going from 100 to 140 on this image. Now, um, I've shown you that handy lenders seem not to price loan by loan and how risky each loan is, and that the premium that is not absorbed by any observable uh, that I observe, they also, they also do. It could be that they're setting their own price for a given market based on the default that they usually face. Okay, a la stimulus and vice. And I'll go back to stimulus and vice uh, in a little bit. So I usually observe 10% of default. I don't know what are the 10% in this room that are gonna default, so I'm gonna give a price to everyone in this room that compensates me for the 10%, and that should be. So what we do here is, instead of loan level, I'm gonna collapse at the market level. And by market, I mean a geography, times online. 
So zip code 12345 at the storefront and zip code 12345 online in a given week. And I, I will have time fixed effects, the geography fixed effects, and uh, controls. And again, it is there. Okay, so even if I control for the exposure to credit risk in the market, what I see is 100 percentage points APR. Wider range on the cost per 100, but still not very far from 4 to 5. And on my other sample, if anything improves, it gets more precise. Now, can I clean this better? I'll try to. Could this be borrower composition? Could this be that different borrowers go to different lenders in different markets in different weeks? It could. Okay, it starts to be very strict. I find it very unlikely. But if you want to push that narrative, I'll have to accept it. So what we do here is I'm going to bend my borrowers in what I call credit risk bins. And what are they? Well, there's a binning scheme that I can do for both of my samples, and a binning scheme that I can only do for the sample in the basic credit score. But basically, I'm going to separate them on age and age and quintiles. And so I'm going to do comparison within this bin. I'm going to throw a bin fixed effect, and I'll only compare borrowers like you and borrowers like you online and at the store. I'm trying to kill this coefficient, okay? I really am. Either on this binning scheme or on credit score. And it's 100% again. Okay, no matter what sample I'm in, my standalone sample, my credit visible, no matter what binning scheme I'm using, it's 100 percentage points, $4 per hundred bar. I know I've been annoying up until now, but I really wanted you to know that the premium exists. This is just to assert the existence of something. That's why I need to be this obnoxious. But now I'm going to tell you why. And I guess that's the part that makes the paper uh, an interesting narrative. I'll try to convince you that information asymmetry is a potential candidate to explain a substantial part of the pre. Okay, so suppose we're building a theory framework, and I'm not a theorist, but I'll, I'll try to think like one, to derive testable hypotheses of what explains this pre. I can try to tie credit risk of a loan with the price of that loan to start with. But I've just seen that the pricing is kind of flat on stuff that predicts credit risk. I could also draw some really I.O.-ish, like a Bertrand competition, a Cournot competition between lenders with different attributes, different technologies. But I don't have lender IDs, then all my, all my testable implications I'm not going to be able to test. So I'll try to do something in which I don't need lender IDs, but I can use a little bit of I.O. And we'll think about a single and bias framework. So it kind of explains how lenders will derive prices under very mild assumptions that actually match my setting. In the sense that there's no hard calls for credit reports on payday loans, so info is really asymmetric. The borrower knows more about themselves than the lender. And what really happens is lenders, for each score, we believe that they basically set the same price for everything which kind of happens in the model, uh, very consistent. And the interest rate that maximizes the profit for the lender ends up being larger than if it would be just a competitive market. It generates credit rate. That's what's happening at the storefront. And then you have your riskier borrowers going on. It kind of matches all the descriptives we've been showing. Now, whenever that credit rate happens, riskier borrowers either adversely select for a higher rate, so they go to online because they know they're risky revealing their type, or just the fact that borrowers with the same risk of online in the storefront, but some get charged more, might make it harder for them to repay, therefore generating the fault. Moral hazard. Okay? Now, a superior technology that allows a lender to maximize profit at a higher rate. Think about ACH, that online lenders use. Um, better analytics that they can use because they collect more data, they have access to databases. Um, and riskier borrowers going into higher rate would make two necessary assumptions on the sickness and vice uh, framework need to be true so that we would observe a two price equilibrium. One, information asymmetry needs to exist in the payday loan market as a whole. 
if there's no gain for the symmetry, uh, I don't even start the stateless and wise setting. And it needs to be higher online than it is at the store. So the info needs to be more asymmetric online than it is at the store. By construction of edits, at the store I can get a lot of soft information. If I'm, placed, if I'm the loan officer in that community for five years, I know a lot of members of that community. I talk to the person, I see how stressed they are. I can see how reliable the paycheck they're giving me is. Okay? So by definition, online, it hides more of the borrower and preserves more of the private information of the borrower than at the storefront. Now, information asymmetry here is going to be a very agnostic concept in regards to is it moral hazard or adverse selection. For us, this is just going to be correlation between price and default. Just like I told you, moral hazard is higher price makes me default more, so these two are both correlated. Adverse selection is the fact that I know that I'm more likely to default makes me accept a higher price, so they're both correlated. So I don't need directionality, I'm just going to use correlation. And this is the logic that Pia Polifania do in their insurance um, paper. So what we're going to do is first a very basic test. So I'm still going to bin people. They're still within bin. I, I don't have a bin fixed effect in there. And I will see how price correlates with default. First, it needs to exist in the whole market, then it needs to be higher on. That's what I test. So I test whether beta APR is positive and significant, and whether the interaction is positive and significant. And it is. Okay? So if information is asymmetric in the whole market, even more online. Graphically, what this means is if I go inside the bin and see if, these, if each fold is charged more than the bin average. So every time I charge you more than folks like you, are you more likely to default? And the slope is way larger online than at the storefront. Okay? The storefront is very flat, still positive. Online, even more. No matter how I measure price, APR or cost per unit. Now, Capri Salinye also do something with a bivariate pro uh, pro uh, problem. We did the same. So two. Um, dummy variables, one default, the other one, you're charged more than your peers inside your bin. Uh, the estimated correlation coefficient is way larger online than at the storefront, but it still exists at the storefront. So the two necessary assumptions are there. So with this, I can tell you now, there's a premium, and there's info asymmetry, and I've waved my hands to say that the premium explains, the, the premium is explained by information asymmetry. And you would be, eh. So I guess now the question is, Philippe, you have 100 percentage points of premium to explain. If information asymmetry only explains three, then you've been wasting my time for the past five minutes. So I'll try to tell you how much of the premium is explained by information asymmetry. So what I want here is, I want a world where the two necessary conditions are shocked. Where in information asymmetry in the market is shocked, and where the asymmetry in information asymmetry between online and the storefront is shot. Luckily, some states implemented a statewide state payday loan database in which lenders are mandated to report and to consult before lending. And so that makes information more spread across lenders, so it decreases information asymmetry between lenders and borrowers in general. But it also gives access to the same information set to those that went online and those that went at the storefront. So it makes their difference smaller as well. Okay. Unlucky is that our sample period starts after the last database was implemented. So what I'm not bringing to you is a pre versus post comparison. It's going to be a cross section. Okay. So what I'm going to look is I'm going to go back to loan level, and I'll have an indicator to whether the loan is an online loan or not, and whether that loan exists in a state that has a database or not. And so the coefficient on the online dummy is the online premium in states with no data in the presence of symmetry. The coefficient on database is the increase in price for having a database on loans at the store. And this coefficient is going to tell me how much of the online premium is reduced by including the database. Oh, I have 
an explanation for this. Okay, and long story short, it reduces everything. So the premium that is ex ante 149 is reduced 158. I have a good database. 125, 147. So the reduction is always enough to kill my whole premium. Put a database in the state, and there's no one way. Cut the information symmetry channel, there's no one way. We do our best attempt to do some time series variation. We don't do pre versus post, but we count the number of years since the database inception. <coughs> and our baseline are states without a database. Blue, way larger than red. Black is the difference. As soon as you put a database, the premium is zero all the way. And the, the two prices are not statistically different. So I'm going to wrap up very early. Um, the message is very simple. Online loans are 100% APR more expensive than store from payday loans. And the premium seems to be explained by information symmetry that only refers to all the consumer market default phase in the market characteristics that we control for do not explain it. The only thing that seems to shut it down is the shocking info symmetry. And I guess this leads to a very important reflection in fintech. So we do finance so that we resolve frictions. We are bringing technology into finance so that that technology helps us resolve frictions. This technology might even allow lenders to profit at higher prices. So wow, technology is amazing. Even in the presence of info symmetry, but if the technology is bringing, and it's not solving information asymmetry, credit is not going to become more accessible. Okay? It's, it's just going to map their ability to be profitable at higher prices into higher prices without solving the solution. And that's it. I really want to hear your questions and discuss these points. Okay. for the organizer inviting me here and it's a very nice conference and the paper is very interesting. I learned a lot from this, especially when I looked at payday some time ago. So uh, let me quickly summarize the finding of this paper. It has done noble work in documenting this online premium and this premium is very significant and it's not due to different um, customer characteristics or different loan types. Um, basically, they just find that it's, there, there's one price fee for, and for online lending, there's a higher fixed fee. And they show that that, that is um, higher default risk for online lending. Um, they try to explain this um, online premium by information asymmetry. And this is very important to understand uh, the fintech and its relationship with information asymmetry as well as a uh, very risky subprime loan market. So I think it's very interesting and I have a couple of thoughts that I would like to share with you all. First is that maybe if you just look at the price difference between online lending and storefront lending, we understate the premium because as Philip mentioned, when you run a uh, storefront, you have a higher fixed cost. Um, and, um, if you do an online lending, you have more efficient repayment mechanism like bank transfer. Okay? Um, well, if you do online lending, consumers can, can just click, click, click and get, uh, and get the loans and they can compare prices, maybe they will, uh, with a lower fixed cost, lower search cost, they will, they will look uh, at different storefronts. So if I set this uh, information asymmetry aside, then we can expect that there would be more competition online, and so maybe that would drive the price down, actually, that compared to storefront lending. And actually, my, I would interpret um, Philip's result for the section with uh, statewide database differently, I think you found that when there is state, uh, statewide database, reducing information asymmetry or 
completely eliminating it, storefront landing has, has, is actually more expensive than online landing. That is kind of the evidence showing that maybe if you just look at the price between storefront landing, online landing, ignoring the cost and the efficiency, then we, we may understate the premium there. Well, on the other hand, I have questions whether information asymmetry would explain um, or is the source explaining this online premium? For the told me not to scream, so I, I tried my best not to scream when he was presenting. It would be very, very nice, very fantastic if we can actually get the online price and the storefront price of the same lender. Then that is a very, very strong identification showing the online premium. Because now we don't have um, lender identifier, we cannot compare the online price versus um, storefront price. Then I was wondering, is it because um, lenders, they're just different lenders? Some, some of them may be more efficient online, some of them focus on storefronts, they have different markups. Or if, the, if, say, even if I have the same lender, different prices, what are we talking about? $4 premium per $100, on average loan is about $350. So I'm, I'm approximately talking about $15, $20 uh, difference in cost. In terms of APR, that's a lot for average $350 loan. But if I think about the absolute dollar amount, $15, is it worth having me going there and coming back from the storefront? If I take a bus, round trip, seven or eight dollars. And if I take the time into consideration, maybe I would just pay the premium because of the search cost instead of just um, I'm riskier. And so, if I look at the results, if I take this um, information asymmetry analysis into account and take more seriously, so I think that search costs would make the market very localized, and that means people either go to online landing or they go to a store that they know, they would just go there. And if that's the, that's the case, um, and the local lender, local store from lender, knowing their customers better, in-person interaction, or they just know, hey, you are from this area, I know this neighborhood, I know the people there, there's, there's some um, soft information, do we see more repeated customers from the storefront? Or, um, if I understand it right, your data has application data, not, not just the loan amount, but application. Do we see um, high rejection rate by storefronts given consumer, the same consumer characteristics? Because I think in your paper, um, you convince us that the, uh, the higher high default rate doesn't cannot be explained by the loan type or the customer characteristics. If it's just some unobservable or in-person soft information, we may actually be able to see high rejection rate at storefronts. But um, I think that's um, the part we are we are missing here. Um, as Philip um, explained in the presentation that. Now we have storefront lending and online lending and we drive some customers to online lending. In the paper I wasn't very sure what's the mechanism driving them to online like, or who are the customers not served by storefronts? Is it a pricing mechanism? That's the, the one that I observe, uh, that I understand from the paper or is it just um, product rationing by saying, no, I'm not going to lend to you, go somewhere else. And they, they, the clients go home and apply online. Um, 
On that, I think there's one very interesting fact not explored in the paper. I don't know if it's even possible. Um, there are two stylized facts mentioned in the paper. One is that uh, overall payday volume declined between 2013 and 2019 because I think the regulation got tightened. The market is getting small. It's just more, um, less, more difficult to operate and less profitable. And at the same time, the share of online lending increases compared to stock on lending. So I think similar um, market tightening had been happening in Canada. They had more restrictive regulations, and that led to storefronts exiting. There, there are more, um, more, more storefront payday lenders that just quit. They just exit the storefront market. And if I think about this, exits of storefronts is not going to be exogenous. It's not like it's not random. It's endogenous to whether they make profits. It can be because um, they know the customer base. This is not a very good area to operate in because. The customers I get uh, are more risky, or I have a hard time understanding whether they are risky or not. So they exit. Those exits would drive people going online. Because now I, I used to have a storefront, but with exits, I don't have a storefront now. I, I'd rather go online instead of going somewhere else. It's that's the mechanism um, driving people online from storefronts because of regulation changes. And my last comment is that um, I'm not exactly sure how the how the statewide database would help. Um, it would be nice if we if we have more information from the paper what's in, what sort of information is included in the statewide database. Like do we get the past performance? Do we get the price there? Or just the loan amount? How timely it is? Because um, myself had talked to credit bureau in the past. They were about to set up um, a payday lending database, actually a real-time database. It's real-time because they are worried about people walking around getting multiple loans on the same day from different payday lenders. I may look not like a trustworthy, I don't know, but a trustworthy um, borrower getting one payday loan. But if I go down a street getting five payday loans from five different payday lenders, that's a different question. Then if, if um, real-time database um, reducing this sort of information asymmetry, then I'm not sure how that would level the, uh, the playing field between online lending and stock on lending because apparently uh, in the past they had the same problem and now they don't, right? Um, so another question I have is um, do we really have no information about, about clients? Um, the idea is that if we have a statewide database, uh, information is more transparent and it's less risky and we can reduce the premium. But isn't that what clarity is about? <laughs> In the sense that they have other sources maybe? Maybe they, they can use other subprime database to check? before or, or in, in states without this statewide database. So what was the value added of this statewide database if there are other sources of information available like Clarity? Maybe it's just that um, Clarity is very expensive or other private databases are more expensive. Um, maybe in states that um, that have statewide database is just a proxy of the regulations we do regulating um, payday uh, practices that would that would make it less risky for everyone. 
or maybe just clarity uh, are the prior database not having a lot of coverage. Um, so uh, administrative database covering the universe would help a lot more. So um, that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Hansen took on uh, very nice points. I, I believe the most challenging one is, uh, or it was, before we had the database test, the convenience in search cost. So could this be explained just because to go to many stores, I need to get into my car and drive, um, and you know I'm willing to pay a little premium, just like the mortgage folks do, to be, be able to just stay in my house in my pajamas and borrow a lot. Um, I had a prior when I when we did the, the database test that like you know out of the hundred percentage point premium, we're gonna see the database reducing thirty to fifty percent, and then. You know, I'm going to have that residual premium that I'm going to say, convenience yield. And that's because it is more convenient. There's support that is in the literature in the mortgage market. It kind of doesn't happen. We don't have anything else left once we separate states with, with uh, database and without. And so it would still be convenient in a, in a state with a database to borrow in my pajamas. So I really don't think that after we have evidence that information symmetry seems to be ruling out everything. If we do a little bit more thinking, the same fintech lenders that are argued to um, give mortgages that allow people to borrow in their pajamas at home also specialize in refinancing prime borrowers. So it's folks for whom the fact that I can't stay home in my pajamas can't have value. The folks that are borrowing here, they're trying not to be shot tomorrow because they owe some more. It's not about convenience. They're willing to do a search. They're willing to get in the car and go get that cash. Okay, and so the convenience, as I see evidence of no space for the convenience yield to exist in states with database, and I start thinking more about who the borrower is, folks that live in, in vulnerable communities, I don't see them traveling in the that much. Now, I had the same prior as you, that there would be space for search costs to uh, turn it down. Something we did was control the sample splits on number of inquiries in the same month. So we go to see if they ping multiple locations, if that explains any of their willingness to pay. And the number of past inquiries in the same, but cumulative number of inquiries and inquiries on that month, it does not explain uh, what we see. Then the point of clarity, one or none of the 13 states use Clarity as a state payday um, loan database. They do have their licensed provider that lenders are mandated to report to and to pay around 50 cents every time they, they look at the database. So that makes it more costly for lenders. They can pass that on. Those 50 cents, they can put it on top of the price for the, for the consumer. And that's our explanation for what we see an increase in price. It's just now we need to develop infrastructure that allows you to report automatically to this database, and you need to pay every time you go check the, um, the database. Um, I agree with you. I'd love to have a uh, lender ID. I still think it would be challenging to see the same lender lending online and at the store. For a, for a simple reason. You can have a holding firm that owns say, green tree storefront payday loans. And then that they own blue shark online payday loans. If these two show in my database under different IDs, having the IDs is still not going to tell me that this is an inter integrated strategy by this big firm that owns both. Right, so beyond having lender IDs, I'd really like to know, are they owned by the same big lending firm that has the same cost of funds? Because the idea, that you told me it's about markups. You want to control for the cost of funding of those lenders, make sure that they have the same cost of funding and that the difference is in markups, right? And then that's the difference I observe is not driven by differences in cost of funding, right? But I would still need to know whether different lender IDs would not pertain to the same bundle of, of cost of funding. 
and that's taking the impossible to beyond the impossible. I, I already don't have all the ideas, much less who owns them. Questions? Yeah. So I, I feel like there could be two stories from both related to asymmetric information that could explain the result. Could explain the results. So suppose these markets are just completely segmented. No, people don't apply for what they either go online or they go in person. I could imagine that in person, there's this screening technology. We screen out for bad borrowers. That results in lower interest rates. Whereas online, we don't do the screening. We lend to everybody, and so the average interest rate is higher. In, this, in the counties with the database, this does the same screening technology as the in-person, and that could explain kind of these differences. Something maybe more complicated related to that. I don't really, that's, I wouldn't call it an adverse selection. But then an adverse selection story would be you go in person and then maybe you, you don't go in person because you don't want to bear that screening cost so you get the separation. I don't know, do you have any sense of like between those two stories what could be going on or if that, or are those in line with kind of the theory that you have in mind at all or? The, those are subsets of the theory. So we on purpose find a very comfortable Info asymmetry land in which we can be agnostic as to whether it is moral hazard or info asymmetry. We just say whatever it is, it generates this correlation, we, we document this correlation, and then when we shock information asymmetry, we do see it disappear. Um, I guess the result that speaks to that a little bit is one, an empirical fact borrowers go online and go to the store. So, one thing I want to show you is. Even when I throw the consumer fix, the fact that would drop singletons. You see this? That would drop singletons out of the um, regression. You don't see the number of observations dropping a lot. So it's very common that I do see observations online and that the score from for the same consumer. If this helps rule out the first story that you had in mind of segmented markets, that gives me comfort. It's a very fuzzy way of looking it up. Be more eligible doing it, doing so. Then the fact that the same consumer seems to choose, so the only significant result on default is the same consumer choosing to default or have made the online price making them default. So it could be more hazard online than at the store. <coughs> Again, kind of speaks to your, to your second story. Okay. So I'm trying to wrap my head around the empirical side. So it seems to me like you start off with a regression that doesn't have the identification, and you say that there's a hundred percentage point difference, and then later on you you use you know the information asymmetry choice to say that yeah indeed there is selection into who goes online versus in person, and that selection is perhaps correlated with some information asymmetry. I know that I'm a bad line, I'm a bad borrower, so I go online and I don't reveal as much information. But then couldn't you also use the data and stuff? to do a more standard kind of broken day and look at when the states introduced using the data or? No, it's a, that's, that's the drawback. The last state introducing the database was before my first observation. So I don't observe the pre in the last state. Okay, I see. Okay, I would love to. If, if Clarity would give me data back to 2008, then I could. Now, I, I do not say that consumers select or that consumers are affected by moral hazard. I say that can be one, the other, or both. Mm -hmm. That whatever it is, I will see this correlation. So I haven't made any causal statement. I'm documenting a conditional difference in prices and telling you that whenever I shock something that I try to argue is more related to online than the storefront, it vanishes. Mm -hmm. But then to, to answer this point about the way you're doing that, you know, you don't, because the, the whole point of the diff and diff is that you can construct a counterfactual in a sense, right? So here it's like you're, you're saying that you're, you're making an inference across states to within states, right? So that's kind of where it would be interesting to think about why did some states adopt it differently? Was that because I know in Canada, for example, there are differences across provinces, like Quebec has a very active consumer regulation agency, the rest of the country follows the federal one more. So there are differences there that could important so it would be nice to see some more background about that. What you're telling me, I agree with you, it could be that before they adopted the database there was already no online premium in those states and I'm not seeing it. Yeah. It could be that their regulation was already stricter and I'm not seeing it. But 
I'm fully transparent about it. I say I'm not observing time series variation. I do observe some, which is if there was a gradual impact of a database. So you implement a database. At first, the database doesn't have many loans there. And then as time goes by, you add more and more loans to the database. So actually, the information set becomes richer and richer and richer. I could expect to see with less years on the database, still some premium that then converges to no premium. That's what we tried there, but it seems that six years was already enough if this is a story for it to converge to zero. We, we're trying to, so the reason why we started at six years is we want to have at least three states identifying each coefficient. We're now going to do a state by state, even though if, if my first state, my last state implementing gives me three, two, one years since database implementation, we want to see that. We want to see if, there, if it starts apart and then if it converges to kind of speak to that, that the premium existed sometime before it did. So do you observe auto loans? So that could be a proxy for people who have car and then you can use it as a proxy for search costs. I don't know if you observe that. And the second thing is, because uh, I'm not sure how, um, about the institutional details of this database, could it be that the online lenders are charging higher, now they have to report and they think, you know what, the regulator might come after me, let me just mark down my prices. So it's not about information asymmetry, it's just that enforcing regulation in this market has become much easier, so I'm just going to adjust my prices. Uh, is that an alternative interpretation? If I, if I had only showed you the database test and no, not any test for influence symmetry, that could be an angle. Now the fact that I show you that influence symmetry exists and that it is higher online, and that when I sh shock information symmetry, the frame disappears, yes, that could be a potential reason. I, I wouldn't see why that would make the frame disappear totally, all of a sudden. Could be. I don't, sorry, I don't know if you showed this, but maybe also to speak to this markup issue, did you show, do you see if there's differences in default rates across the online versus in-person in the state of the database? Because if you see no difference in interest rate, I guess you would expect no difference in default rates, but if you still see some difference in default rate, that might speak to something about whether this is markups, roughly, but not exactly, but it could hint at that to some extent. So run the database and uh, on default. Yeah, yeah. And see if the database makes the fault converge, or if there's still an existing default difference, but no premium. Yeah, because also these, a lot of these models of adverse selection, you can get, it could be that it's a competitive market and you're just getting worse pool entering here, or because there's more information asymmetry, they have more market power, and that could be leading to higher interest rates. So it's disentangled, you could maybe disentangle that looking at something like that. No, I haven't, and I should. That's my answer. We have seven minutes, and I really would like to okay. prove the paper, so... Yeah, um, so, you're, so you said you don't observe the prices for the people who default, and you just sort of estimate if they're matching. Because I don't actually think it's that big a deal, but aren't you kind of assuming away asymmetric information when you do that? Right, like, you, there can't be any moral hazard effect of premiums on default rates if you are assuming it that way, if you're matching from the people who don't default. How so? Right, like a lot of this asymmetric information stuff is correlation between demand and cost. Mm. And so, and then the moral hazard, if there's higher premiums cause more defaults. And so you're just matching based on the people who do default, but you don't actually see their premiums. There should be some correlation you're missing. But then I wouldn't see this, right? So when I, it, within the same bin, mm -hmm. when I charge them more than the average of the bin, they actually tend to default more. So what you're saying is it would absorb. Yeah, so maybe the effects effect. actually should be stronger. Anyway. Yeah. Um, my other comment too is, so for the Kiyokori and Solani tests, it's really important that you get every single factor that people price on. Um, but isn't part of your story is that the storefront people pick up soft things and can price on those? So stuff that wouldn't be in your data that would be picking up in that residual test, but is not <coughs> actually an unpriced thing. Yeah, or, or at least you you know how more, so when I give you proof of income and I show you my pay stub, mm -hmm. at the storefront, you know that same income number 
yeah. is more room. So you, me and you both price on income, but you're more sure about the income that's being shown to you than I am. Well, because the and then I put you in a bin in the income bin. Because in the the Q-Force line of paper, it's like auto insurance that's mm -hmm. priced very formulaically, and they have everything the insurer sees. And like the last two thirds of the paper is going through a bunch of weird binning exercises to make sure they're getting it right. And so, but if you have something that like you you don't see everything. Like maybe the storefront does see the, your, your confidence. I think there's an example you used or something like that. That's going to mess up that test. Yes. I, I have more in my error that I can't fix. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that correlates. Because it's supposed to be the stuff that's not used in pricing mm -hmm. correlated with defaults. But if some of that stuff in your error term is actually used in pricing, and it shouldn't be in there. I don't think, I mean, there's not much you can do about that. No. Just add it for yeah, I can call this an, an imperfect Capri yeah. Sonnier type of list. Yeah, make, make a referee happy. I have another question. Maybe a generic question, not about the term generic. You know, when FinTech uh, comes right, in a market where there is uh, people lending uh, in person, and fintech is that it's a technology, right? It should make things better for the society in general. In your result, when there, there is state intervention happening, it, it kind of you know makes it even rather than why does it? You know, what's the policy implication in terms of you know do we push fintech in payday or should we not push fintech? And if we should push fintech, how should we push it to make the payday system more convenient for customers? Okay, um, as I told you in the end of the presentation, uh, FinTech is good when it comes to solve the friction. When it comes to exacerbate the friction, then it actually starts being the purpose of the technology. Now, as I said yesterday during your presentation, we need to look at FinTech more broadly. And I guess a very important piece of FinTech that's here are databases. Right? And implementing the database and making people adopt that database. That was what the states did. Uh, and it seemingly uh, made uh, payday lenders become more accessible. Now, what is the, the implication of this? I do believe, like Hanson said, federally, also, so that information being shared across states is also important because if I live in the border of Tennessee and Kentucky, and they already know my credit quality in Kentucky, I can just go to Tennessee lender, and then if my loans in Kentucky are not in the Tennessee database, you have again an information that's into friction, right? And so what is a policy implication? Databases seem to make credit markets work better. There are fintech innovation, because in its technology that serves finance, then why not apply it federally with information about all the loans the border takes to make credit provision more fair? That's what I'm to say. It's a function of the credit. It's not about bringing online to lend and not solve any info symmetry. It's about solving the info symmetry technology. And what solves it? Yeah. Thanks for a fascinating paper. I mean, this 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 payday lending and then the online payday lending uh, the market on top of that. Like I always thought it was an insane market, and now it's like make it even more insane. So sort of super super interesting. Um, and I have to keep uh, thinking about, so I need to put my economics hat on to think about this. Can we rationalize this in a way that this... Uh, so, if you think of the, the markup on online uh, from a perspective of... of like, you, you seem to come from the angle that there should be no markup between online and... Uh, or this, the market should be lower compared to online and, and in, in, in store. Uh, say, say for argument's sake that the, the, the online market is rationalizable uh, there, and that uh, providing information kills this markup. Say, say for, you can think of maybe stories of risk selection, uh, that for some reason local payday lenders on the storefront uh, can do more in, in handling risk selection of their customers than online. Because online you get everybody in your local store, you get local people around and they're risky but you sort of can average out how risky they are online you have more variance uh, and it shows up in the price uh, i can think of other stories to it too but that's that uh, 
if, if, if then you kill the price, so the price goes down, then you would expect that then there's going to be a rationing on quantity of loans. And then the question is, do you see that in the... You see the, you see the, price, the prices equalize? Is that going to have an effect on, say, uh, quantities of loans, loans amounts, uh, number of people that are being accepted for loans, uh, and, and or selection on observables there? I don't know if I see that, but I'm, I'm going to say the same I said for default. I should do it. Because if I want my database test to be a strong test, then it should have implications for default and for quantities. So, thanks. I, I agree with you. Um, I do not defend that uh, markups should be similar. Like this, this does not come from markups. I say that for me to be able to speak on markups, I would have to have data that I don't. Okay? I would love to show you. Oh, there's a premium. It's about cost of funding. Why? Or, oh, it's a premium. It's about info asymmetry. But all I want is, first, this premium is everywhere. No matter what I do with my data, it is there. Therefore, I need to explain it. And all I want is an explanation that is convincing and that explains a substantial part of, of the premium. I would love to be able to even decompose it. This is because of pure info asymmetry. This is because of markup. This is because of convenience. I would love to do all those exercises. I have no space because info symmetry seems to uh, explain everything. Now, what I'm not doing that I would love to is to tell you how, through which channel is information asymmetry killing the premium. Is it that my investors demand uh, more required return because information is more opaque when I lend online? It could be still a markup story that is related with info asymmetry. I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.